Well, thank you very much. I have a luxurious period of time, 30 minutes. Uh, the usual way to start a presentation about cybercrime is to tell you that things are going to get worse and worse, and you're going to lose more and more money. Um, the bigger the number is that I'm throwing at you, the bigger the hope of the people that are presenting is that you're going to pay attention. Um, I'm going to start a completely different way. You're, going to, you're not going to hear that from me. I'm going to speak um, about the, the risk, but I want to make it more personal. Let me start optimistic, because I really believe in in technology, I believe that there are positive sides of technology. And I'd like to take you back to 2014. Those of you who invested in stock markets in emerging countries had a pretty good year. Um, take, for example, India, a plus 30%. That was a very, very good investment. Those of you who attended conferences like this one and heard something about Bitcoin, and decided in December 2013 that this is the time to invest into this currency, had a pretty bad year. By the end of the year, you lost 70% of your value. So new technology does not necessarily mean um, they work the traditional way. I guess that some people who are not the greatest fan of central banks, I guess there are not that many here in the room, but in general, there are some people who don't believe in central banks. They would have been particularly happy to have a central bank that would be able to influence this course development, but um, there was not. So that was, um, that was a development that a lot of people were following, and it was interesting. There were other developments. I don't uh, want to touch upon the political part. ISIS declared the caliphate, and this three years later has led to a president with small hands touching big topics like immigration in the United States. That's, we'll leave this aside and, and, and just focus on the technology. There is something that happened in 2014 that some people in this room might not have heard of. The first time a machine passed the Turing test. A Turing test is an experimental environment that was created by a scientist to find out if a computer system is actually a smart machine. If there is artificial intelligence, I mean, you can, you can put a label on it and just say it is there, but in a more fact-driven environment, um, and I'm not talking about US politics now, I'm talking about uh, in general, in, in science, there you want to have a test, and this test is the Turing test. You put a machine in one room, close the door, put a human being in front of a computer system that is not smart in another room, and bring in a ref, um, somebody who doesn't know in which room is the machine and in which room is the human, and kind of referee, and he needs to ask them questions and find out where is the machine. You can ask any question. In the past, that was rather easy. If, if you ask a machine, what's your favorite song, it would probably say something like, with 99.72 point likelihood, it is ABC. <laughs> and then you would know that's not a human. <laughs> but in 2014, for the first time, a machine was able to answer in a way that the person would not be able to say, who is the human and where is the machine? That shows you that these machines are learning. As a side remark, uh, this is uh, talking about, I'm supposed to talk about cyber crime and cyber security, and, and I'm gonna talk about this, but in, in, and as a reference, we can speak about one of the big incidents. Uh, this is Ashley Madison, where the database of, of this dating portal um, leaked, and a lot of people were pretty embarrassed because they were married, didn't tell their wife that they were on this platform looking for affairs. So you could say the data breach is a big thing that, that, that happened pretty recently. But more interesting is some of the research that was going on. There were people that were analyzing who is actually communicating, because the anti-business model is if you're communicating, you're paying. Uh, so the more messengers sent, the better for the company. You need 50% male and 50% female participants around, and that's what they were communicating. But when analyzing those leaked files, it looked more like there were very few females and significantly more guys. The question is, do these females communicate with multiple guys and just send out hundreds and thousands of messages? No, most likely those guys were talking to bots. They were talking to machines. That is actually a real world implementation of that technology. You can, as a, as a guy on, on 140 characters sending short messages, you can speak to somebody and believe that's the most beautiful girl and she wants to meet you and date you and do whatever kind of things with you. Uh, and she can continue to motivate you to text. So we, we can say that there is a, Reality proof that with regard to average 40, 50 year old guys, that already works. So we can, we can <laughs> a machine can, can pretend it's a human. So, so, so these are amazing, amazing developments. Now you might say that's far away from me. 
And actually, I, I, I agree, that's very far away from me. Most of my work is advising governments and, and CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, and, and one part of that is negotiating international agreements. So I'm not working for the US government, I'm not gonna renegotiate NAFTA and all these other things, but this kind of things, bilateral agreements. And I always thought, you know what, I'm pretty safe in my job because there are just very few experts in this field and basically the people always hire the people with experience. So if you have experience, there is basically no way to get out of the system. Unless, until a, a company, a startup, hire 12 of us, 12 negotiators from different places in the world. Most of, we know each other, there are not that many out there. So they put us in a room and put a lot of cameras up and all kinds of things and they said, okay, you're supposed to negotiate now an international trade agreement. Um, in, we, we signed ag agreements, said maximum 12 hours. So they said, you can finish in one hour, but we won't pay you more than 12 hours. We were paid by hours. Um, and we want you to, to, to negotiate six people on the one side, six on the other side, an international trade agreement. And we were interested, we had to come up with a wording and with a fixed price, and we did this, and we were wondering, what are they doing? They were sometimes coming in, checking if we were still there, but that was all, there was no big interaction. And at the end, of, I mean, guess how long it took? If they pay you by hour, 12 hours. So after 12 hours of tough negotiations, we were there and done, and we, we came up to this agreement, and we handed it over, and basically they wanted to leave the room. So we said, wait a moment, come back. What is this all about? We would like to know this. And they said, well, fair point, we're gonna show you something. We developed an artificial intelligence that does negotiations. So you can say, well, that's pretty basic. It's not, because you have to be able to lie at the right time. Um, and and, and that's, that can be pretty difficult. If you get the wrong time, well, that's not good. So you need, to, you need to do it right. You can observe how the best negotiator, his own characterization, Donald Trump did it with the Mexican government. That did not work out the way you want it. So if you sell a software that would do this kind of things, probably they wanted to have their money back. But you, they, they said they have developed the software. And they said, okay, we're gonna show you, they're gonna do, negotiate the same agreement. Well, it took less than a second uh, for this agreement to reach, for, for these machines to reach an agreement and a price. The price was almost identical. You had to look pretty far behind the comma to find the difference. The wording was almost identical apart from one clause. Um, now you can say, how can it be identical? They can't look in your brain. Well, but we all copy and paste. I mean, I don't reinvent the wheel every time I'm doing something. You would learn, you would see, okay, this clause worked very well, so we take this, and here we take this one. Okay, after two weeks I got a call, and they wanted to speak about this one clause where we were different. Um, and we had agreed in our contract that they would be able to call us, and they, they had a couple of questions about this. And I didn't really understand what was going on. But what turned out is that this clause that we came up with is weaker than the one that the artificial intelligence came up with, but it took them two weeks to find out. Because this clause was, was, was uh, uh, contested in courts, um, but nobody in, in the room knew that. So it took them two weeks, they were trying to find out, and then after, after two weeks they realized, damn, this machine in less than one second was better than actually the 12 well-paid humans in this room. Um, that is an, an interesting development. It shows you a little bit, you know, we can even substitute very complex work by machines. And in many areas, they're better. And I have to, I have to give the machine credit. And I can see that in, in, in various areas of my work, I can be substituted. I'm drafting laws for governments. Man, I, I know, maybe I drafted 50 in, in, in a particular field, and I know maybe 200, but I can't compete with the machine that knows every of them. So we have to be prepared for a development where a lot of things can be substituted. Um, and, and things like, are you gonna trust your artificial intelligence? It's gonna be really interesting because one of the, the, the questions I'm always running into when I'm talking to CEOs and, and, and ministers, so CEOs of the really big companies that are trying to think about digitalization and future trends, the main question is, is there gonna be a fight man against machine? Uh, this Terminator thing that is deep in their head and they're just completely influenced by this. So they're taking decisions about the future of the company based on a movie, a series of a couple of movies that they saw and say, oh my God, the machines are gonna take over. That is very difficult if you, if you, if you argue like this with those people because I don't think that this is the biggest problem. I'm, I'm trying to tell them you're, you're taking yourself way too important because if this planet is too small for humans and machines, the good thing for the machine is they can live on any other planet. Uh, you can send them to Mars, you send them up with a 3D printer, um, you're gonna print machines, they can, you can print a new one every second day, 
and you set up a relay station, you can send up the latest artificial intelligence with light speed, and they can live there. They, they don't need to breathe air. They can live on the entire planet while we are stuck to this planet. So it's, I don't see this as the biggest challenge, but one of the biggest challenges, and this is why this topic was mentioned before, cybersecurity is so important, is that we are relying on decisions made by machines. In this experiment that I told you about, it took them two weeks to find out that one clause from the machine is better than actually what we came up with. But imagine in the future the machines are getting smarter and smarter. And one day the machine will say, hey, you know what? We ran into the ultimate solution to stop global warming. And you can live your lifestyle, you can continue, but we can still stop global warming. It is a very, very simple thing. Well, it's a very complex formula, and I, it took me a long time to calculate it, but actually, ultimately, you just have to release certain gas, gas into the atmosphere in a very high concentration. Yes, it might look like you're poisoning yourself, but you're wrong, because this is so complex, this entire thing, that ultimately, it will bring out something really good. Well, the question is, what happens if all scientists in the world will need 1,000 years to go through that formula, because it's so complex? Uh, will we trust the machine and say, hey, let's release the gas? Or will we say, no, I don't trust the machine, and because I don't trust the machine, um, I'm not going to take this decision. That's going to be an important thing. If we trust the machines when they're smarter than we are, um, and this will happen more and more frequently, and this is why we need to discuss the downsides of it. Okay, that was the positive development. Now about the negative development. Um, well, in... And maybe speaking for one second about Europe. I'm, I was born in Europe. I believe in Europe. I'm even teaching European law. So, so I, I'm uh, enthusiastic about the idea of the European Union, despite the criticism. But when you're comparing the approach that other countries are taking with regard to this new technology, and you compare it to Europe, we are having a major problem, because we're criticizing everything that is happening out there. I'm not, again, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to to be critical about things, but it is breathtaking how critical we are. Uh, when we talked about developments like big data, that was a big topic a couple of years ago, we always said, oh, data protection. Don't, don't collect my data. That's, that's not good. I don't want you to collect my data. When we talked about the Internet of Things, connecting things to the Internet, uh, the majority of, of politicians in Europe I was speaking with are, were asking me the question, why precisely do I need to connect a fridge to the Internet? Well, if the vision if your ideas, what you could do with this technology, is limited to connecting a fridge to the internet, and you did not come with more ideas, we have a problem. Because there is so much more you can do. And I can see it here again. Artificial intelligence, a lot of people see this very negatively. And I understand it. I have full, there is full respect for a critical debate, but I see the difficulties. 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago by now, I. Uh, founded a computer company and I developed, we developed early artificial intelligence machine learning. Uh, in a field, it was about medicine, um, and you know, we realized doctors, I, I was studying medicine at this time, and I realized doctors are not really that good, certain things, they're just messing up and a machine could do it much better. That was our belief. And we developed an artificial intelligence, very, very early form of machine learning, that was able to do it better than the doctors. Well, I sold this company, and there was another company that was really, really happy about taking this forward, and they banked against the wall uh, because the doctors criticized that their work would actually be evaluated the moment an artificial intelligence would be used because it would show their weaknesses. And that is not possible. Even if you save a patient's life, if you at the same time disclose that a doctor didn't do his job properly, no, sorry, we don't want this technology. So they refused to implement this technology. I'm not sure. If, if this is the approach we should undertake. I think we should be very critical with regard to the development, but we shouldn't be overcritical. Okay, 15 minutes left. The, and I want to integrate you. So it's close to the end of this conference. Um, there's going to be an exciting panel. Um, I have to do something to keep, you, to keep you busy. And you're going to be integrated in a few seconds. Just one thing. The attacks that we see right now are more and more complex. It does not help you if I'm telling you, well, the, the, the losses increase, um, there is a single company that I was advising in Europe that lost more money than the statistic of the federal police here in Germany is indicating as overall loss of all companies for the last year. Uh, a single company losing more money through uh, cyber attacks. That doesn't help you because it doesn't tell you, am I affected? If you're a decision maker, yes, you are. 
And this is one of the focus areas I would like to point out. We see an increase in quality of attacks against decision makers. Uh, people, CEOs of companies, ministers, and so on. And I would like to present to you one, one case that maybe explains to you that you should not look into the press to, to get this kind of information, this intelligence, because you won't find it there. They're speaking about things that matter to the majority of the readers, uh, but not necessarily focused on decision makers. Um, there was a CFO of a company, and he was responsible for merger and acquisition. And he was responsible for a major deal. And a competitor really wanted to find out what is he doing? What's the status? What's the whole development? But this guy was, oh, he was very careful. He did not talk to his assistant, to his employees. He, he was really very isolated, and he did everything with his mobile phone. Now, you might say that's not a good idea, but they're trying to break into his phone, and they did not succeed. They tried everything. It was a pretty well-protected phone. They had all kinds of software tools on it to protect that phone. And they were unable to do it. They did even find out through the yellow press where is he spending his, week, his, his vacation with his family, and it was always in the same hotel. They booked a suite in that hotel, and I mean, you all know this. When you're in a hotel, you're logging onto the Wi-Fi because you want to avoid roaming costs. And they set up a Wi-Fi with the same name as the hotel, and uh, they wanted to infect his machine and all of this, but it didn't work. The hotel found out that didn't work. Then they, this competitor thought, okay, got rid of them. We need different people, more professional people. And I found a couple, there, there are professional services sold on the internet. Uh, there's, uh, you, can, you can follow this. Europol is publishing a lot about this, um, about, about the, the, the development, this field, crime as a service. You can hire people and they do the job for you. And actually they found a group and they said, okay, first of all, what budget do we have? Uh, and they said, oh, well, if you, if you get this, you get your honorarium, but in addition, we give you a budget for expenses of 50,000. And they said, good. They sent, they found, a, they just did a kind of background research about this guy. And they saw he's giving speeches from time to time, and what's his favorite topic that he doesn't need to prepare, and they found one topic. And then through a speaker agency, they sent him a request, saying, we would like to invite you to speak in front of Chinese investors. Um, you get 25,000 for a one-hour keynote. Um, you get a five-star hotel, first-class flight for you and your wife, four days, perfect, beautiful vacation. And guess what he said? He said, yes, I agree. So he flew over, he was picked up by a limousine, taken to the hotel, all fancy, all wonderful. He was taken to an amazing conference venue. He went through a security check, uh, just like the ones you have here, a little bit smaller. And um, then he went, gave a, gave a keynote in front of 20 Chinese looking people that didn't ask any questions. He went to the hotel, was very happy, no questions, wonderful. Six months later, he dropped his phone. And they saw, he took it to, take, to the tech people, and, and, and they saw it, and saw there is a chip in there that should not be there. That's not an original chip. And they discovered what happened is that this phone was manipulated. It had the best software, but there was a hardware manipulation that would actually send out information from that phone. And they wondered, where, was, where did this happen? And it happened when this guy went through the security check. It takes less than 30 seconds. I have a short video. I'm going to play it without sound, just to the people in the back. Um, I'm going to play this without sound because it has this. OK. So this shows you how long it takes to manipulate a phone. And you have to imagine you're going through a, a, an x-ray. Um, they're going to say, stop for a second. Um, then they're checking your, your legs, first of all, your shoulders. It takes time. And then during this time, you're not paying attention to what happens to your phone. Um, and 30 seconds is really nothing, if you, if you remember just your experiences at the airport. Um, this is my staff doing it. I mean, they're doing it by hand. This is, this is a joke. You can, you can do it much more professionally, but it shows you what you can do in 30 seconds. And um, that's scary if you, if you think about it, the degree of, of, of time they're investigating in this. So, so we in investing in this. So we need, to, we need to make sure that we are aware of what is happening. Now, I have 10 more minutes. And what I would like to do right now is I think it's very comfortable to sit there and listen to me um, and say, okay, yeah, it's an important topic, absolutely. But I would like to put you in the driver's seat. So I would like to, to say, let's assume for a second we're gonna take a private bank. Um, this is called Hartman Banking Group. Um, it's a private bank operating in Europe.